all the district department of energy does the purpose of this is to show you how to use your imagination a foundation in science technology is here now developing these technologies for science climate change we're talking about energy big dreams clean energy is way of the future this is direct current Hello and welcome to Direct Current, an energy.gov podcast. Episode 10. Yeah, 10. A good round number to cap the first season of the show. And we're really excited to share this one with you. As always, I'm Allison Lantero. And I'm Matt Dozier. And with the current presidential administration coming to a close, we asked a very special guest to share some thoughts on his time here at the Energy Department. Who am I and why am I here? <laughs> We're going to use that. Sorry. That's right. It's our boss, nuclear physicist and secretary of energy, Dr. Ernest Moniz. Well, I'm Ernie Moniz. I'm uh, U.S. Energy Secretary, the 13th in line, and uh, presumably that's been a lucky number. This is the last episode of Direct Current as the secretary leaves the building. <laughs> How about that? Right. <laughs> secretary Moniz is running out the door and we're trying to right. chase him with the microphone. We actually sat down with him in his office overlooking Independence Avenue, so you might hear some street noise in the background. We're here with another episode of Direct Current, sitting down with Secretary Ernest Moniz. Thank you for being with us today, sir. It's a pleasure. We wanted to start off with asking, what was your best day on the job? Well, it's hard to pick a single best day, but uh, certainly the day in which we signed the Iran deal uh, was um, pretty close to the top. Uh, another one I have to say is when uh, we had the announcement uh, in Paris of Mission Innovation, which put uh, innovation and energy technology right at the middle of addressing climate change. So those were two two high points. But, you know, I think the real pleasure in the job is uh, day in and day out um, uh, really advancing what I just think is a preeminent uh, science, science organization in the world uh, and applying that to, to important problems. But certainly in terms of singular days, those, would, those two would be hard to beat. What about your hardest day? Well, you know, we uh, have our ups and downs, and uh, certainly one uh, occurred uh, just about three years ago when we had uh, the accidents uh, at uh, WIP, and we had to close uh, for three years. Uh, and um, we're pretty optimistic that we're going to be cutting the ribbon on a reopening uh, very, very shortly. So that WIPP, be, that's that W-I-P-P, -P, is the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in New Mexico. It's where we store nuclear waste from defense activities deep underground, and it actually reopened on January 9th, 2017, after we recorded this interview. So this is a very, very big day, and i got to say, our team did a fabulous job over the last months to, uh, to, get, to get to this point. What were your expectations coming into the job? Well, you know, first of all, I, I did have um, a more of a running start than, than most uh, from the point of view of having been here previously uh, in the Clinton administration as undersecretary. So, you know, I knew pretty well the, uh, the missions of the department, uh, the, the laboratories. Uh, but being here now, uh, you know, uh, I guess 12 years uh, after, uh, after I left, uh, the opportunities were much greater, partly uh, because uh, I really was fortunate to be here at a time when the president uh, exercised very successfully personal leadership on two of his priorities internationally. Uh, one was on climate change and the uh, uh, energy innovation solutions for climate change. And secondly was nuclear security. Uh, of course, he put forward the Prague Agenda, so-called, in uh, 2009, and then had a series of nuclear security summits. Uh, this completely elevated uh, the posture uh, for addressing nonproliferation uh, among roughly 50 countries. So, you know, those are two uh, areas right in the sweet spot uh, of this department. Uh, and so being able to uh, to work with my colleagues here, uh, colleagues across the government in many cases, uh, on those two uh, really high priorities of the president uh, was just an extraordinary opportunity. And I got to say, DOE delivered. You already knew what to expect going in then, right? Yeah, again, so I, I knew basically what, you know, what our missions uh, were. Uh, I uh, didn't come in here uh, with uh, uh, expectations of, uh, of, of a more focused department. I knew we, we, did, uh, we did science uh, very, very critically. We did energy. We do nuclear deterrence. We do nuclear nonproliferation. We clean up from the Cold War. Uh, we, we do all that. 
Uh, but I, of course, I also understood uh, how the department at its core is a science and technology organization. What was very uh, uh, great uh, to, to, to see was the opportunity now to really elevate in many ways the view of, and in some sense, the performance of the national laboratories. You know, you've mentioned some already, but where would you say we've made the most progress in your time as the Secretary of Energy? Well, first of all, there's, a, there's, there's the programmatic progress. Uh, and uh, and cer certainly if I take energy, uh, the, the progress uh, in working with other partners in the private sector, but the progress in driving down the costs of clean energy uh, has just been really, really incredible. Uh, the most extreme, in a certain sense, uh, LED lighting uh, with a 94% reduction in costs uh, uh, in the last uh, seven, eight years uh, is pretty, pretty spectacular. Of course, the driving innovation, as I said earlier, to the center of the climate response internationally uh, was a, I think, again, very, very important progress that will be sustained uh, in the years forward. In science, uh, we've uh, continued, I think, a critical role, which is to continue designing, building, and operating facilities that are at the cutting edge, uh, light sources, neutron sources, uh, accelerators uh, that serve over 30,000 American scientists uh, every year at the cutting edge. And indeed, you know, while it may not be the most important factoid, uh, it is nevertheless uh, an interesting one that those facilities served as the foundation for six Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry that were awarded during this president's administration. Uh, there's a lot more. There's over 100 uh, through the history of the, of the, of the department, uh, but just in these years. So it gives you an idea what, what those facilities mean to the country's uh, researchers. Uh, another area is uh, the progress that we've continued to make in high-performance computing. We've been the leaders for decades. We continue that. Uh, we are on the march to what's called exascale, 10 to the 18th uh, operations per second. But even more important, in my view, is we are now launching into a new arena where it's not just how fast is the machine, it's how does the machine handle enormous databases of the kinds that we are we are dealing with uh, uh, today. How do we get the machines to learn themselves where to go and find the right data uh, to, to, to put them together? And that's going to that's going to serve our traditional missions uh, in the weapons program, uh, in climate science and, and, uh, and across the board, but not well known to the public yet. Uh, that's also the foundation of what we, we, do, we are doing at the center of the Cancer Moonshot uh, project. And uh, we have uh, been sought out and, uh, well, by the vice president, but also by the head of the Cancer Institute, by the head of uh, Veterans Affairs uh, for partnerships. And in fact, uh, a great milestone was reached only a few weeks ago when an enormous database, uh, I mean enormous database, was delivered to one of our laboratories uh, to start the work with, with Veterans Affairs on, on understanding uh, cancer, and we expect that's going to save veterans' lives. So uh, this department does a lot of incredible things. So far, I've only covered energy and science. Uh, then in nuclear security, uh, in terms of the progress, well, you know, very important, important progress is the continuation of our science-based stockpile stewardship program, which means that even as we shrink our uh, nuclear weapon stockpile, uh, and we have, we have been doing so, we continue to be able to certify every year to the president, uh, and frankly, I have just signed off for this year, uh, on the uh, safety, security, and effectiveness of the deterrent without nuclear testing. Uh, and uh, that is extremely important, particularly when I add the without testing. Uh, uh, it's been since 1992 since we tested. Uh, and, uh, and these, they get older and older, but we get better and better in terms of understanding the science and being able to, uh, to sustain them uh, in a way that, uh, that gives, gives our national security posture uh, really its, its, its foundation. But beyond that, uh, we have, as part of, the, again, the president's prog agenda, 
uh, we have removed um, high enriched uranium and, uh, and plutonium from uh, 14 countries, um, uh, enough for about 160 nuclear weapons if, if it fell into the wrong hands. Uh, we've, we've got whole regions, South America, Southeast Asia, that have become totally free of these materials. I should have mentioned Iran, of course. Another thing on nuclear security was, of course, the Iran negotiation. And, uh, and uh, I think that um, certainly the scientific community, uh, it was expressed again in a letter that they sent to the president-elect. They sent a letter reinforcing how the agreement breaks completely new ground in nonproliferation, verification, and, and transparency uh, with novel features that, I'll be honest, uh, I would love to see eventually become part of the broader safeguards uh, approach that IAEA can take uh, internationally. Uh, but that, that was a big, uh, um, uh, obviously a big uh, step forward. Uh, and, um, and frankly, once again, I go back to the theme. Uh, unknown for most of the negotiation, at least, um, seven of our national laboratories and two of our nuclear sites uh, were essential in providing the uh, analytical uh, work that underpinned the American uh, and Western, well, not only Western, P5 plus one um, uh, negotiating posture. P5, I should say, perhaps explain, uh, P5 are the, are the permanent members of the Security Council, the five members, uh, and the plus one is Germany. Another one that we don't talk about enough, uh, and I wish there were just another couple of months uh, 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 for this one at least, and that is that uh, working with the Navy, it's a joint program, uh, we have designed new nuclear reactors to power the next generation aircraft carrier. It's called the Ford class, named after President Gerald Ford. And that first Ford class aircraft carrier will be on the water uh, in a couple of months. Uh, that's a big, a big step forward uh, uh, there, there as well. Again, I, you can tell I'm very enthusiastic about the work that we do here, uh, the people we have doing it. Uh, it's just terrific. And I'll say it again because I never get tired of it. It's a science and technology powerhouse serving the American people uh, in, in, in critical missions. Um, you mentioned earlier the Paris Climate Summit. And talking about uh, the progress we've made, especially with clean energy solutions, is all this progress going to last? Absolutely. Uh, I think the first thing is to emphasize that, uh, certainly in my view, uh, there's no going back. Uh, there may be bumps in the road in various places, uh, but uh, after Paris, with every country in the world uh, committing to a, a low carbon trajectory, at least into the 2025, 2030 timeframe, uh, uh, there's no going back. Uh, we, we are heading to a low carbon world. Uh, we need to participate in that very, very aggressively and actively, not just because, you know, we, we and President Obama certainly has been, been a leader in getting us to the place that we are at, working with China and other uh, major, major economies, uh, but also because innovation here is going to be critical and we are talking frankly, about a multi-trillion dollar clean energy uh, opportunity uh, globally. Uh, in fact, not so long ago, an arm of the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, estimated that just in 21 emerging economies, there would be a $23 trillion opportunity to 2030 uh, uh, just, just in, those, in those countries. So we want to innovate and we want to stay ahead of that and we want to get our share of that market, uh, even as we transform our own, our own economy. Finally, I would add to that, the, uh, you know, businessmen, I would say, also understand, largely at least, uh, that we're not going back. Uh, that uh, if you look not just one year, but if you look 10 years and 20 years and 30 years down the road, we're going to be going to a low carbon economy. Well, those businessmen are often being called upon to make billion dollar scale capital commitments for projects that last on a, a maybe five years to 10 years and then run for decades beyond that. Uh, I think a uh, chief risk officer of a corporation 
would not be doing a very good job to suggest laying out billions of dollars right now, uh, betting on a high carbon world uh, in the uh, in the future. So so I think that uh, that you know we this this is the direction we're going. Uh, we have a lot of the tools we need right now in terms of clean energy technology, uh, certainly to get us to our Paris goals of the United States. That's in 2025. I think we're on track for meeting our goals in 2020 and in 2025, but if you start talking about the deep decarbonization that's going to be called for beyond that, going out to mid-century, we've got a lot of innovating yet, uh, uh, left, uh, left to do. Uh, in fact, what I would say is that you know, the, the biggest progress we've made uh, in terms of uh, lower carbon has been in the electricity sector, and that's a combination of natural gas substituting for coal because of the uh, market dynamics and the rapid growth of renewables, especially wind and, and now solar, uh, uh, coming up. But to get to deep decarbonization, we've got to complete that job in the power sector, but we also have to do transportation, we also have to do industry, uh, and uh, this, is going, this, is, this is challenging. So, so we need to both push the deployment and the continued cost reduction of what we're working with now, while at the same time, we research some of the very fundamental science problems that will allow bigger breakthroughs for, for deep decarbonization down the road. This department is, is right, in, right in the thick of that. In fact, uh, we will be putting out, um, not long from now, uh, just over a week probably, we will be putting out a portfolio that, that maps out in general terms how we would use a doubling of the energy R&D budget to meet those kinds of long-term goals for the environment, for the economy, and for security. For better or for worse, your uh, people tend to recognize you for your hair. Are you surprised by the amount of attention your hair has gotten? I had a period of surprise. Uh, I've gotten over it. I think they have too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you've been living with it for many, many decades, like five, uh, you know, you don't think about it. <laughs> but apparently others did. But uh, I, think, I think we're all past that phase. <laughs> um, you said earlier that this is your second time leaving the energy department. Um, you have a lot of perspective from not just the past three and a half years, but from your previous time with the agency. Um, how's the feeling of stepping down now compared to the last time? Well, I can assure you uh, in uh, both times, uh, it was my assumption that that was the end of my public service. Uh, I think that is uh, that it's apparently uh, was incorrect the first time. I do believe it will be correct this time. Uh, but uh, uh, but look, the jobs are different. I mean, as, as undersecretary, I I, I really uh, enjoyed tremendously my uh, my my time here. I might add that at that time, uh, when I when I came here the first time, there was only one undersecretary, and so I did actually have you know reach, if you like, across, across the entire department, uh, which has been very helpful in my, in my new role, uh, clearly. Uh, but uh, now as secretary, obviously it's a little bit different. And, uh, um, but what I really appreciate is then that gave me the chance to really uh, put together, uh, uh, you know, the, the senior staffing of the department, uh, both, uh, both those who are, uh, you know, confirmed by the Senate and, and those who act as uh, my my direct advisors and and, and colleagues, and uh, I have to say that uh, I think this team is is absolutely outstanding. Um, uh, I may not be fully objective, but I think by far the best uh, team uh, that this department has had overall um, uh, because of the depth of of the of the talent. Uh, and so now, going back to your question, uh, in leaving, it's it's it's. Um, it's bittersweet uh, in the sense of seeing this team uh, obviously uh, uh, break up uh, in a sense. Now we're hopefully we're all going to be working on issues like climate, like nuclear security, and uh, we'll probably be staying in touch. But it's different to to be doing things, you know, uh, individually or, or with small groups as opposed to uh, a team that we can 
talk with every morning in our in our in our morning meeting and and uh, talk about where we're going uh, uh, that day that week that month that year uh, and uh, so you know it'll be it'll be different but uh, I've always believed you know you you just just look look, look for the next uh, next adventure I have to say uh, uh, something that it's going to be pretty it's, it's hard for me now to see how I will maintain the streak in which I could claim that every job I had was the best one I had. Uh, this may be tough to top. To, to cap it off, um, after all the wonderful experience you've had here, what, what advice do you want to give your successor? Well, first of all, the first part of advice is, is uh, obviously you, each person will have a different style, a different, a different way of, uh, of, of approaching. Uh, the uh, the management uh, of, of, of the department uh, but I think the common elements uh, are uh, to to recognize uh, that again this department is its strength its distinctiveness among the cabinet agencies uh, is its core of science and technology just permeating all all the missions so I think that has to be appreciated I want to make it clear that does not mean you have to be a scientist to, you know, to, to manage the department uh, uh, successfully. Uh, I have to say, for me personally, because that's who I am, uh, I was able to use that background, you know, rather consistently. Uh, but, but you have to put a team together, uh, uh, as, as I have. Uh, my team is not composed all of scientists. Uh, you, you, need, you need different, uh, different skill sets. But I think uh, the next secretary um, uh, really, you know, certainly needs to, I think, uh, really internalize how science and technology uh, gives this department a distinct flavor, uh, how the 17 national laboratories are essential to, uh, are, they are in many ways our essential assets for applying science and technology to our, to our problems. Uh, uh, use the lab directors. Uh, in a strategic role because they're out there, they're close to the science and, and, and technology. The laboratories are the ones who do the science and technology and, you know, they work out really how you should go about solving those, those problems. Uh, but in turn, using them as strategic assets for thinking about the directions that we want to go in uh, with, our, with our research portfolio. So I think, um, uh, I think those are some keys to success uh, in uh, getting the best out of, out of DOE, uh, no matter who the secretary is. So I have one uh, final very important uh, question, which is, um, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? European or African? How do you know so much about swallows? <laughs> uh, and I would say about 11 meters per second. Spot on, according European. to our background research. European. European, of course. Right. Of course. Okay, well, thank you. Very well done. Yes. Right. Um, well, thank you, Secretary Moniz, for welcome. being here with us. Yes, thank you so Terrific. much. Okay, thank you. Once again, we'd like to thank Ernest Moniz, the Energy Department's preeminent nuclear physicist and Monty Python enthusiast, for joining us on the podcast. And of course, thank you to everyone who has listened to the show over the past eight months. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed making it. That wraps it up for season one of Direct Current. We'll be back with more great energy stories, so stay tuned for details about future episodes. If you missed any of the shows from this season, you can find them all on iTunes or on our website at energy.gov podcast. If you have questions or comments or ideas for stories you'd like to hear, you can email us at directcurrent at hq.doe.gov or tweet at energy. Direct Current is produced by Matt Dozier, Simon Edelman, and me, Allison Lantero, with producer Pat Adams, art and design by Court Creer. Support from Paul Lester, Daniel Wood, Atikwar H, and Ernie Ambrose. Thanks to John LaRue, Amy Phillips-Birch, and the Energy Public Affairs team, and to Kevin Fitzmorris, Ryan Robinson, Val Battle, Francie Harris, and everyone in the Secretary's office for helping arrange the interview. This show would not be possible without the support of Aoife McCarthy, Evan Burnham-Snyder, and especially our boss, Marissa Newhall. Thank you all so, so much. We're a production of the Department of Energy and published from our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Until next time, thanks for listening.